Okay, so yeah, I guess maybe just a little background before we actually get into the nuts and bolts of the talk. Uh, my name is Pat, Pat or Pat, Patrick, either one. Um, I'm originally from the United States, uh, as you might very tell from my accent. Um, actually, the southern United States. I grew up in uh, South Mississippi, and then I went and got my doctorate at the University of Georgia in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, and then uh, after that, pretty much immediately after that, we moved, me and my partner, um, who gave, I think, the, maybe the first talk, Amber, was that the first talk? Or, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, moved here, uh, and yeah, been here for, I guess, about four years now or something like that. My research, uh, my doctorate research was based in New Orleans. I did a, I'm an anthropologist, so I did a, a you know, kind of classic ethnography, uh, going and staying, living with the people that, you know, I'm working with on, on my research. Uh, so I went to New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, and basically for yeah, about a year, uh, worked and lived with a group, kind of the, the anarchist uh, milieu of the city, essentially. Um, lived in a kind of, kind of a, kind of a squat, I guess you'd call it. Um, worked at a worker owned and operated a bookshop and lending library, and then did some work with a local level food justice collective, essentially people who were, you know, advocating that food, food is a right, that people should have access to it. So um, then I wrote all that up in my. Doctor, so uh, along the way, I've been interested in political economy and politics. Uh, and one area where the kind of research I did around anarchy um, and politics and so on came together was, or touched on, was the notion of gift. Um, and as we'll see, uh, the gift is very kind of multifaceted, right? Um, so let's get, get to that. So I thought I'd open this with this classic um, image uh, from Man Ray. Uh, he called Cadu, which is French for gift. Um, and, you know, it's just a, a uh, what do you call it, a iron, right, that you put like 13 tacks on. Now, I don't really want to, you know, I'm, first of all, I mean, I'm a humble anthropologist, not an art uh, historian or art scholar. So uh, you, you can probably tell me much more about this than I can you. But I'll leave it at that. I don't really want to kind of right now, you know, uh, over explore this, but maybe just raise the question of, you know, why, right? What, what is the, the kind of point of this item, this kind of useful item basically made, in, made unuseful uh, with these tags, right? So that's something to think about, and maybe we'll return to. And why, also, why the gift, right? And again, I'm not saying this is necessarily my interpretation of this is not necessarily what Man Ray had in mind. Maybe it was, maybe it isn't. But it's a way we can kind of think about the gift um, in a couple of dimensions. So we'll come back to that maybe towards the end. But to start out, um, you know, I think any discussion of the gift uh, has to kind of begin, or you know, at least somewhat, with the work of Marcel Mauss. Um, he was essentially uh, kind of uh, the way well, he was. He was nephew of Emil Durkheim, who was kind of the founder of French sociology, modern French sociology. Um, most kind of worked in a number of worlds. He he worked, uh, at, you know, with his uncle on developing their kind of sociological theories. But he, you know, he was a kind of multivariate <laughs> scholar. So he also engaged a lot with ethnography as it existed at the time. He engaged a lot in anthropology. Um, so today, I think anthros and sociologists both tend to claim Mose as an ancestor. Uh, his most, again, to, to this talk, his most relevant work was his book in 1925 uh, titled The Gift. And in the book, he examines three primary, three uh, uh, societies outside of Europe, essentially. So he looks at Northwest Coast Native Americans, the Quaqutal. He looks at a group of, um, or society in Melanesia, um, the uh, Trobriand Islands, uh, and uh, let's see, where else? Uh, Melanesia, Trobriands, and oh, well, he also looks at kind of ancient, ancient law codes and things like that. Most could read uh, a couple scripts, uh, Sanskrit, um, you know, Latin, etc. So. He looks at those things. Uh, through this kind of wide survey, it's essentially a survey of 
uh, gift practices through space, geographically, and cross-culturally, um, but also uh, temporally. So it looks kind of it gift practices through time by looking again at kind of ancient law codes um, from you know, uh, ancient India to uh, ancient Ger Germany um, and Roman law and so on. So what he derives from this is that in gift systems, the kind of basic principle um, that he sees repeated over and over, the basic core premise of gift economies um, comes down to these three, what he calls these three obligations. Uh, the obligation to give, the obligation to receive, and the obligation to return. These are, uh, we can think obligations, a lot of people use the term, the term reciprocities, forms of reciprocity. Uh, but these three premises, or three um, obligations for most is understood to generate um, a, a, a variety of gift economies. And for, for most, he's using the term economy not in a very narrow sense, in a kind of not the way a contemporary economists would use it in terms of markets or something like that. In fact, the whole, one of the whole points of Moses' research is to question this idea of the primacy of the market and the primacy of capitalism um, outside of Europe, uh, you know, Euro-America. Um, he essentially wants to demonstrate that other, as he calls them, civilizations in the past um, and in the contemporary world uh, that are outside of the West uh, operate it or to, you know, either very, you know, almost wholly or at least to a larger degree on these principles of the gift as, as compared to Western Europe. Now, what Moses is trying to do to some extent is challenge this notion. A number of people I know in the discussion earlier, uh, you know, the, the word human nature came up. Um, and Moses is really trying to challenge the, this kind of assumptions about what human nature is um, in the realm of economy, right? So in his day and today, um, kind of mainline economic thinking has it that, you know, humans are by nature selfish, um, self-maximizing, uh, looking only to kind of, uh, you know, increase our, our personal uh, benefit or personal share with the least amount of work possible, that sort of thing. And most, you know, doesn't necessarily deny that that's an aspect of human nature, but uh, Moses' argument is, well, human nature is actually much more complex than that. Um, and today, uh, you know, I can say in anthropology, that's more or less the view I think most anthropologists would have as well. Uh, yes, you know, we can look at history. History demonstrates humans are violent, vicious, uh, greedy, uh, etc. History also dem demonstrates that humans are uh, pleasant and loving and kind, caring, nurturing. Right, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes we're all those things at once, um, and so you know, again, Moses is trying to get to some other logic. He's trying to get to some other logic outside of this kind of single narrow narrow vision of what humanity can be. So he he again looks at the gift, and his argument is that the gift doesn't necessarily create one single system. It can actually create a multitude of different systems. Some of those are more egalitarian, some of those are hierarchical, right? So they vary. Let's see. Any, uh, any thoughts or questions about any of that stuff right now? Or Okay. Um, so one of the uh, areas that Moses is very famous for looking at is uh, this, this practice, this kind of uh, intra-island trade in Melanesia and the Trobrian Islands, um, where ethnographers had noted that you have these two classes or two types of valuables, right? So you have the shell uh, necklaces, which is called uh, shalava, um, and then you have these kind of uh, shell armbands, moali, um, and they are items of exchange or gift gifting amongst uh, the inhabitants of program people uh, who occupy this large uh, chain of islands, essentially. Um, and what happens is, periodically, uh, there'll be uh, a kind of time to re-engage with this exchange, 
So people will hold rituals, festivals, things like that, and then go on these ocean journeys to, to the various islands, right? And they carry either you know, this, this type of armband or this type of necklace. Um, one, on these trips, these inter-island trips, uh, the necklace ritually tended to move along this kind of circle or network kind of circle um, clockwise, right? Meanwhile, the armband tended to move counterclockwise, kind of ritually. So you have these two circuits that are moving in, you know, in between this kind of network of islands. And Mose was really fascinated by this. It wasn't just, you know, this, this movement of these armbands, but it was also other, like, lesser goods and sort of food and, you know, arts and crafts and things like that. It also circulated with them. But these were the <coughs> prestige items, if you will. Now, these armbands and necklaces, uh, you know, most points out, have no real utility. They're not, they don't do anything that, you know, that you can't like use them to hammer nails or something like that. They're just items um, of, you know, aesthetic pleasure or whatnot. But they're also, they're also items that carry a history with them. Um, all these armbands and, and necklaces, uh, as they kind of rotate through this, this network of islands, they, they pick up um, elements of the people who possess them, the histories of people who possess them. They pick up, um, in some ways, you know, most talks about the personality. Uh, they become personalized um, with the people who possess them. So the items themselves start to kind of be understood as kind of having a kind of personality. Um, they become famous, right? So um, as you move around this kind of circular clockwise and counterclockwise motion, um, trading partners or gift, gifting partners will meet and so, you know, Nathan is my gifting partner, so we meet, and, uh, you know, he seems like he's, you know, a great guy, and I want to establish some sort of relationship with him. Well, I use, say so I have the armband, I give him the armband, and then, you know, he essentially accepts it because it's more or less an obligation, and, you know, he accepts the, the armband, um, and that establishes a bond, right? Now, what happens, though, is he doesn't give me the armband back at least directly, right? What happens is Nathan then goes to the next island and gives the armband to another person, right? And then another person gives it away, another person. Eventually, it may come back to me. It might be years, right? But this, the, the item will circulate. No one keeps the gifts, right? They keep, they're always in motion. Now that always in motion might be months to years. They might be stable, but then they're in motion again, right? So why is this? Right. Most his position was ultimately that um, the gift creates a kind of social bond. Um, most, as a sociologist, as the nephew of Emil Durkheim, the founder of French sociology, they were really concerned about how social structure emerges. You know? How is it um, maintained? Uh, how does society hold together? And for most, at least in the context of the cooler ring, this trait, this exchange of gifts. Um, it's the gifts themselves that kind of create relationships, create bonds between people. Um, and, you know, yeah. So that's essentially, you know, one version of it, right? So from this, these three basic principles to give, to receive, to return, you get an entire social system essentially emerging from that through these practices of gift exchange. But, um, again, that's not the only social system that could emerge. And we'll talk about uh, another that actually, in some ways, overshadows the cooler ring in terms of kind of 20th century interest, right? But we'll get to that. So, you know, some points that I think are worth pointing out. Most understood the gift as what he called total, a total social phenomenon, or a uh, sometimes it's translated as total social services. But the idea is that the gift, because it ha it's this kind of generative mechanism, this kind of producer of bonds and relationships, um, it's not confined to, to some narrow understanding of the economy. It bleeds into uh, or operates in multiple spheres of social life. So it operates in religion. It operates in forms of ritual. It operates in forms of yeah, economy. It operates politically um, and other social institutions. Uh, and you know, for most, he, he essentially looks at um, 
Western, you know, French society in the early 20th century, and he's, you know, somewhat critical of, of that. And his argument is that, you know, one of the problems of contemporary life in the West is that we've moved away from this notion of the gift as something that is, um, that is kind of fundamental, right? So, you know, gifts have been marginalized to specific holidays, maybe birthdays or something like that, but they're not interval, uh, at least um, explicitly interval to uh, the way we understand economy and politics and so on. Now, for most, he understands the gift that is total social services not just as a kind of immediate uh, situation of exchanges, but as essentially an endless cycle of reciprocity um, within and between generations, right? So it's, it continues, right? It's not just something that is um, you know, temporary. But again, as I said, the value of the gift is the social bond that it creates, either individually between two people um, or collectively in terms of social structures and institutions and things like that. Uh, interestingly enough, the gift tends to resist equivalence, and it can't really be used to settle accounts, um, as most might put it. And what I mean by that is, if we think about the uses of money, money is about universal equivalence. Everything essentially can be valued or evaluated um, in terms of this universal measure that is money. Um, this chair has a monetary price. You know, these, these boots have a monetary price. Um, your labor has a monetary price, right? Um, and, you know, we can value it according to that single measure. Whereas, uh, most argue that the thing that makes the gift dynamic is the fact that it resists equivalence. Uh, essentially, what happens when you give a gift, even today in our own society, when you give a gift, it kind of puts the other person in a kind of debt. Um, not the kind of debt where, you know, the bank comes and like shakes you upside down and takes your money, but a certain obligation you might feel to reciprocate, right? Um, so what happens is there's a kind of imbalance, an inequality even, if you will, where that exists until uh, that gift is, you know, given back. Uh, but then, you know, normally, you know, what happens, you know, these things can escalate. So it's like, uh, you know, I gave Nathan a nice gift of, you know, those shoes or something, and he enjoyed that. So next time he gave me something else, but it's a little bit, it's a little bit better. He's just letting me know how much he appreciated the, the, the first gift, right? Well, then I'm like, man, Nathan just gave me something really, really awesome. I need to, you know, I need to get him back. We, you know, that's what we do. We're friends. We exchange things, right? And that's the thing. So the gift, the idea is there's always this kind of imbalance within the relationship, and that actually adds to this dynamic. Now, it can't be too great, that imbalance, that inequality, because uh, that can translate structurally into uh, hierarchical dominating forms of politics. And we'll actually talk about a case of this um, in a second. Um, and it can't be too small, because then the dynamic, the kind of feeling that I need to give um, dissipates. Right? Um, <clears throat> so the gift, again, it, it tends to not be about settling accounts. Another way we can think about this is, if, you know, I say, oh, I really like those shoes, Nathan. Uh, how much? And you say, oh, you know, 20, 20 pounds or something like that. Uh, you know, I give him the 20 pounds, I take the shoes. We, we need not have any other dealings with each other, right? It's unimportant, what's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it sort of cancels it out. Right, you, it's canceled you, out, you, you right. You paid me and so Done, that's it's it. done, right? Yeah. Whereas, whereas uh, with a gift, you know, uh, that's not, it doesn't get canceled. It continues, potentially. Um, now, sometimes, you know, people forget or people aren't, aren't uh, particularly committed um, to this, these principles of reciprocity, so the gift can go, you know, go wrong as well. But, you know, in a kind of ideal situation, the gift is more or less a kind of ongoing relationship, a social bond. Yeah? I just love what you're drawing out here about creativity, that underpins all these mm -hmm, sure. exchange systems that we've got so there is in the commitment that we make mm -hmm. to each other yeah. to accept a gift and give a gift back there's a creative action oh, yes. that we're giving ourselves to and you know 
we like to have a sense that we are choosing, yes. but then there's the complicated aspect yes. of having to survive in the world and render value out of our time. Uh -huh. The big creative project that I'm working on at the moment is recording interviews with people in Vanuatu who make shell money uh -huh. okay. and with right. connecting with a Northwest Pacific community uh -huh. um, called the Tulalip uh -huh. who also make shell money. Uh -huh. And there's that's kind of making me much less romantic about this yeah, no, because it's, there's uh, a transformation of you know they they live by the coast so they work the shellfish and then yeah. you know you, wherever you are you're going to be transforming creatively the conditions of your environment right. right and turning that into something which allows everyone to live sure sure and that can be healthy <laughs> that can be healthy <laughs> or not yeah really well, well and, and we'll get to a, a example where you know maybe it's a, it's more domination than it is liberation uh -huh. or creativity or something like that. But I mean, I would say also, you know, uh, in terms of the creative thing, the creative aspect. I mean, ultimately, the gift is generative. You know, and from Moses' perspective, the gift is generative because it creates social relations. And you know, that what what are those relations though? I mean, again, that can vary. Moses doesn't have a prescription that says it has to be this way or that way. It can, you know, the gift is that's the kind of creativity of it. It can go in a lot of different directions. Um, any other thoughts or questions or anything? Right now, okay. Um, so, you know, but most, in his research, he identifies um, a thing, a, a phenomenon, a gift institution he calls a potlatch. And he says, we propose to reserve the term potlatch for this kind of institution that with less risk and more accuracy, but also at greater length, we might call total services of an antagonistic type, right? And that's, I think that's key. These are total services of an antagonistic type. So most of these, um, the potlatch, uh, which he takes the word from uh, Northwest Coast Native American uh, groups who use this term to designate this time and event of ritual feasting, uh, ritual celebration, that involves the ritual display and giving of gifts amongst nobles. The, the, these particular groups on the Northwest Coast um, <clears throat> tended to have very, you know, a relatively hierarchical organization. I mean, they, they, you know, had royalty, essentially nobles. So you'd have these noble houses, essentially. Uh, and within these kind of noble houses or noble clans, they would compete at these uh, potlatch events to see who could give the most away. So you'd have essentially two nobles, the head of their households, um, you know, saying to each other, yeah, I will give you 10, you know, uh, 100 blankets, right? Uh, and essentially the idea in this case is not to create a bond of friendship per se, but it's actually an attempt to create a bond of subordination. Because the challenge that I just laid down by saying I'm going to give you 100 blankets is, well, now you have to, for your honor, for your sense of self-worth and dignity, have to uh, uh, rise to the challenge and give me 200 blankets or 150 blankets or whatever, right? So the idea of these contests, these antagonistic contests, essentially create situations where you have this rivalry between these various kind of noble uh, houses and the competition is, you know, again, to see who, uh, you know, who can give the most away. Uh, and if you can't, if you fail at that, then uh, you become, <laughs> maybe, in the long run, you might become a vassal of one house. You might, you know, you lose your honor, you lose face, or, uh, you know, whatnot. Esteem, prestige. Um, so these things are all kind of on the line in these potlatch uh, events. This is a picture from... Uh, a kind of ritualized uh, production uh, involving potlatch actors. So uh, this is from the Quaquetl, who are, again, Northwest Coast Native Americans, uh, First Nation peoples, who uh, create these elaborate masks. I mean, these are, these are not small, small-time rituals, right? I mean, these are big productions, almost theatrical productions. Uh, so you create these elaborate masks and uh, various types of dancing gear and things like that. Um, and this is all just part of this kind of ritualized festival, right? And while the nobles are competing, you know, at this higher level of kind of uh, competition, their subjects, the, or family, lower, you know, members of their family, are, you know, feasting and, you know, also exchanging gifts and things like that. So, and these are periodic uh, rituals. Now, for some reason, I'm not exactly sure... Uh, <clears throat> 
why, uh, but in the 20th century, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, the 20th century, uh, artists and radical kind of avant-garde thinkers really latched on to this notion of the potlatch. Um, and again, I'm not exactly sure why. I mean, it's, it's very dramatic. You know, I mean, most kind of describes this very dramatic uh, thing, but I mean, there, there are other instances of gift economies people could have, you know, uh, kind of picked to latch, latch on to, but the potlatch, I guess, again, I guess because it's so dramatic, it just grabbed people's imaginations. Um, so we'll get, we'll, we'll get to that uh, in a second, this kind of transformation of the potlatch from anthropological interest to political and artistic one. But uh, any questions or thoughts this far here? Right. The last version, the version you're talking about there is, is war by gift giving. Yeah, it's war. It's war. It's a social war. Sure. 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 Absolutely. No, they, that's a fair, fair summation. Yeah. I mean, they're avoiding. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I'm not killing war. anybody. Right. Uh, and it's you know, it's a it's it's a good it's a good alternative to yeah. killing people, killing people, don't get me wrong. Sure. But that's that, that's what we're talking about. I, I was just I just have this feeling that part of the translation into the the art sphere no. was a comment on this this society thing about the spiral. Uh -huh. about an improvement spiral. Uh -huh. It's got to improve, it's got mm. to get better, it's got to get bigger, it's got to get brighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that mm. is a very good parallel uh -huh. to what we're doing, where we go, uh, oh yeah, the GDP's got to go up, mm. or we're failing. Uh -huh. It's uh -huh. a problem. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, in it's ways. All by, so I, yeah. I, it's just I thought I think that, I think that's the link. Yeah. Well, certainly. I mean, again, the 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 interesting thing that happens um, in the 20th century, uh, one thing that does happen is the potlatch. You know, Moses is interested in it again because of this kind of antagonism, um, this rivalry that happens, and he he sees this as actually an outlier. For most of the gift systems that he looks at, it's not that way. Most of the gift systems uh, have pretty low levels of this sort of antagonism, if at all. Um, but this, for most, is kind of an outlier, so it, it interests them even more. Um, but what happens is, the, I think some of the 20th century artists and radicals, you know, when they're reading most, they may have kind of missed, missed that and <laughs> took it for kind of the, you know, this is the gift system. Because a lot of the radicals, when they write about it, they actually don't really include the antagonism. They even talk about this as some sort of pure gift or something like that, and it's, it's not the case. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll get to some of that. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, has anyone been to one of those festivals or alternative communities that functions on gift giving rather than money? I have not. No. Okay. I've been to, I've, I've lived in a community where people exchange things rather than money, whether that's time or mm -hmm. other kinds of things, food, but nothing kind of... Potlatch. No. no problem. <laughs> Nothing as ostentatious as that. Sure. Now, I mean, imagine today if you know that if, if the idea of rivalry was settled by potlatch by you know our nobles, such as our billionaires and millionaires, right? Um, you know, Bill Gates and Zuckerberg get into like some sort of dispute about who's going to give their employees the most health insurance, um, or you know, who's who's going to give their employees the most uh, you know cars or something like that. I mean, that's essentially the kind of today might be the equivalent of this. Um, Okay, so finally, I mean, all of this kind of raises this issue about values. I know that came up earlier. Um, and really, in terms of kind of anthropology and kind of economic anthropology, the way we uh, tend to think about, you know, value, well, one, it's a very tricky and slippery concept, right? It's very uh, nebulous, right? What do we mean by value versus values, right? Um, I think an easy way to think about this, and I mean, the way we can kind of look at the gift versus, say, money or, say, capital, um, is to think of values in terms of, you know, qualitative values and quantitative value, right? This, this kind of quantitative single measurement, right? That's money, right? Money is, reduces things to an equivalence, right? This kind of numerical price, this numerical value, whereas the quality, the the nature of things, the, um, the physical aspects of things, uh, the emotional resonances of things, and so on, can't really be, uh, I think, without maybe doing violence to them, uh, equalized, 
right? And that's really what gift, gifts tie into in terms of value. Uh, it's, you know, it's gifts kind of positions um, between value and values in a lot of ways, right? Particularly in our society. Because now, like, if you're going to give a gift to somebody, so birthday present or Christmas present or something like that, what do you normally do? You normally buy it, right? Maybe you buy them a bottle of wine or you buy them a, you know, uh, I don't know, a racing car, whatever it is, um, and so on. So, you know, at one point, the gift is a commodity that you bought, and then at another point, the gift becomes a gift, like a true gift because you've given and you've created some sort of social bond or maintained a social bond. So that's something to think about, just kind of keep in mind this value and values, right? And how sometimes things can move back and forth. Okay, so kind of moving into the 20th century, uh, this is just a picture, uh, uh, image that uh, Andre Breton uh, created, uh, titled African Mask. Um, Anybody, I mean, I'm a room full of art people, right? So, I mean, Breton, anybody from here, you know, uh, what, what is he famous for? He's like, like the godfather of Surrealism. Exactly, right. Wrote the Surrealist Manifesto in 1924. Um, and, I mean, interesting enough, I mean, you look at that date, he wrote the Surrealist Manifesto in 24, most published the gift in 25. Um, they were both in Paris at the same time. In fact, Breton and a number of other Surrealists attended Moses' lectures. Um, and, um, you know, when he would give these kind of public lectures about economy and gifting and things like that, um, they would attend these lectures, right? And uh, so there's a direct, <laughs> a direct connection between Mose and, and surrealism in that way. Um, they're interested, I mean, Breton is, this is later, this is the 1940s, but, you know, there, there is a certain interest in kind of non-Western forms of art uh, in the 20s. Um, that's certainly, you know, uh, an interest that I think some of the surrealists uh, you know, had. Um, but that's, you know, this, I guess I want to point this out mainly because this is kind of a bridge between, you know, direct bridge between kind of Moses' anthropological work and then its uptake in the kind of art and avant-garde uh, world with Breton and these other early surrealists. But really, I think probably the most important element or important kind of contr uh, contributor to this kind of uptake of most in the art world is the work of, uh, uh, now I do not speak French, Bataille, Bataille, um, and his journal, uh, Cephalae, which uh, was kind of both a journal or review uh, journal and a secret society. Like he, uh, <laughs> He organized like the journal and you know, a couple of his friends, we were all part of a secret society or whatever. Um, but he was really fascinated by Moses' work. He was really fascinated by the idea of the gift. Um, and he ended up writing several books, uh, papers, kind of around some of those ideas. The most famous one is a book called The Cursed Share. Um, now, you know, Bre but, but Ty, he was a, uh, let's, how do we say this? An illuminated madman is a term that I, I like. Um, you know, he, he was interested in economy, he was interested in politics, but he always came at it, I think, with this creative kind of artistic eye to it. So always somewhat askew, always somewhat kind of left field. Um, and, you know, that led him to in a, in a way, kind of following some of Moses' basic critique of the way we imagine economy, to propose this notion of excess. And this appears in his um, uh, The Cursed Share. But for, for you know, for, for Ty, it was, he almost turned the notion of economy upside down, right? So when we think of main, kind of mainstream economy today and in the past, the idea was that the economy is premised, the, the basic idea of the economy is premised on scarcity, right? Um, you know, doing the most, the most efficiently with scarce resources. Well, Bataille said, well, actually, let's think about this, again, almost upside down and say that, no, um, if we look at first the kind of, you know, uh, the source of economy, the source of life itself, uh, the sun, Right, the sun generates um, you know, immense amounts of energy that then interact with the earth, that then feed um, uh, 
living organisms on this planet that then take that energy in a new form and distribute it um, in their own growth cycle, you know, and so on, like plants, right, photosynthesis, and all of that. But for humans, we take that energy, grow with it, of course, mature, etc. But we also turn that energy into culture. We turn that energy into society. We turn that energy into economic systems. Um, and the question for for Matai was not. Um, uh, you know, not what to do with scarcity, but what to do with surplus, what to do with this excess energy. For Matai, all of culture is essentially the excretions of the sun. It's this excess energy of the sun, this <laughs> excess energy that we, uh, we uh, use and, and, and essentially distribute. Um, and his question was, um, you know, we have this excess and we can um, uh, distribute it in ways that you know, support us and nurture us, um, or it can be used in violent expenditure, right? We can destroy it, right? We can just dissipate it in war and things like that. Um, this is where I think most and Bataille connect in terms of the potlatch, because the potlatch for Bataille was kind of a model of this, this uh, violent excess, this kind of destructive uh, form of, of excess. Right, but for, you know, he also saw in the contemporary economy, essentially capital, uh, you know, behaves in similar ways. So, you know, I have here, you know, uh, uh, kind of enlarged it, but yeah, excess or the circulation of energy in the economy of useless expenditure. Now, what, I, what do I mean by useless? Well, what he meant by that was this idea that um, the use is this kind of basic bare minimum use of energy in terms of just keeping you alive, right? The useless for him um, is that, that excess, is that cultural production, the art production, the uh, production of war and peace and things like that. Um, so he kind of, again, he, he takes these terms and, and turns them you know, sideways or upside down in a lot of ways. Any, any questions, any thoughts about any of that right now? i just ask a quick yeah. um, It sort of makes me think, like the opposite of this would be efficiency. So, uh, so like, for example, a lot of sort of green mm -hmm. um, uh, campaigning is on the idea of sort of using resources sure. better. Yeah. Right. And a, a lot of the time, that's meant to mean more efficiently. Yes. Yeah. And and so the idea of sort of generosity and and like abundance and stuff isn't really in there very much and I wonder if that sort of puts people off a bit and, and makes them feel like they can't recognize that in their own lives because people like to be generous to each other yeah uh, there's something there sure no, I think I think it's true and I mean again like uh, you know I, I think that you know uh, I would argue that this notion of uh, efficiency is predicated on again this notion of scarcity and uh, he would argue we have to challenge that. We have to challenge this idea that there is no abundance, um, you know, and so on. So again, it's this, it's this wild kind of uh, difficult way of, of approaching this, right? So I just, I like it because it's provocative. It makes us think again, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, what if it is not a question of we don't have enough, but we actually do have enough, we just don't distribute it uh, very well, or we just don't distribute it um, in a way that can bring joy and peace versus war and chaos, that sort of thing. Um, so that's that's uh, kind of a tie. And he becomes a bridge for a slightly later development uh, of the situation as international, right? These kind of avant-garde radical uh, folks uh, in France uh, played a, a role in the 1968 uh, uprising there, the famous you know, 68 in France. Um, you know, Guy de, uh, Guy de Bord is probably the foremost, you know, kind of figurehead for this movement. But it was international. I mean, there were situationist chapters in, uh, uh, you know, in France, here in, in Britain. I want to say there were a few in some of the Scandinavian countries um, and maybe a few other places. But their idea was, I guess, this kind of blending of art and politics to an extent. I mean, their position um, was that. Uh, art can't simply be uh, something that, you know, is static or just sets in a room, uh, you know, on display or something like that. 
the, and the reason why they call themselves situationists is because they wanted to create what they call situations. Um, this is their art, this creation of, you know, they would say ambiances, situations, uh, things in daily life, these interventions in daily life that, you know, kind of jar us out of our, um, I don't know, sleep, if, if I mean, I'm, the board would use that term, um, and so on, right? So part of this manifests in production of materials like this, right? So just kind of uh, propaganda uh, posters, right? Uh, I don't go... I don't want to go to work today. I don't think I'll go tomorrow. Let's take control of our lives and live for pleasure, not pain. You know, those sorts of things, right? But it extended beyond that. They have this notion or technique they call psychogeography, which, um, you know, they would have the kind of moving around the cities in you know, Paris or, or wherever, um, and, you know, I guess kind of produce or experience the, the atmosphere, the ambiance of these uh, streets, right? Um, they also, you know, worked on this kind of approach that really is a precursor to what we talk about today. We talk about culture jamming. We talk about uh, what is subvertising, things like that. Um, you know, that they use this term detrema, and it's this idea of kind of taking elements of existing culture and then recombining them in kind of jarring ways, right? So this kind of comic book image, uh, you know, and then replacing the words in the thought balloon with, you know, these kind of subversive messages, right? My thoughts have been replaced by moving images. Um, now, the connection also between the situationist and uh, Mose is, you know, Debord was a fan. He read, he read uh, Mose's work, but they named their first kind of collective publication uh, after uh, the potlatch. It was called Potlatch. Um, and the idea was, you know, this is a kind of exchange. It's, I think the, the masthead of it said Potlatch, it can only be given, or something like that. So it was this kind of free, uh, this notion of, of a free gift, um, and so on. So, yeah. So, um, you know, again, the Situationist, uh, you know, 1960s, 1970s, uh, kind of. I think in a lot of ways kind of form the basis of what we talk about today in terms of these, you know, these types of interventions, right? And in the readings, I don't know if anybody got a chance to read it, but Roger Sanzi, um, he, he talks about this kind of move towards uh, relational art, right? And this idea of art very, very much along situations lines, you know, art has to be uh, a relation, has to establish some sort of relationship um, with the person or the audience or whatnot viewing, right? It has to kind of integrate us into itself to some extent. Um, so again, I think we're back at the social bond, right? Uh, art is creating some sort of bond, uh, this notion of relational art, at least the way Sanzi um, puts it. Okay, so uh, any thoughts, any questions about any of that stuff? Okay. Um, I'll just <coughs> conclude with a quote from Marshall Solomons, an anthropologist, who I think to your uh, statement about war, it says, for, for most, essentially, for the war of every man against every man, most substitutes the exchange of everything between everybody. And um, I like that quote. I think it's, it gets very much the kind of the political um, heart of Moses' project, right? The, the question, this idea of, of uh, the classic idea of political economy and also politics itself in the West of this kind of every man against every man or every person against every person. It's war of all against all, as Hobbes uh, famously said, um, for an alternative system, right? The exchange of everything by, with everybody. Um, it's kind of free and open uh, economy based on the principles of the gift. Uh, I think that's all I got. So, any, yeah.